Melodic Heavy Metal. Playing it heavier. Louder. Raunchy. Faster. This is the signals of intuition. We are the ones pushing me up the hinges. We are You're listening to The Signals of Intuition, your home for melodic hard rock and heavy metal. That right there was Sasha Pate's Masters of Ceremony. That track was Weight of the World from their new album, Signs of Wings. The band is something of a super group. Um, you've got Sasha Pate on guitar, and Sasha used to be the guitar player for Heaven's Gate. He also plays with Avantasia, but he's also a very renowned record producer in the power metal scene. He's worked with Rhapsody, Camelot on most of their albums, Ed Guy, as well as Ang and a number of other bands through the years. On lead vocals, we've got Adrian Cowan. She's the singer of Seven Spires. We've got two members of Avantasia as well. We've got Andre Nagenfeind on bass and Felix Bonke on drums, who also used to be in Ed Guy. And on keyboards, we've got Corvin Bon of Uli John Roth's band, Gamma Ray, and many others as well. We've got Sasha calling in, so let's get him on the line right now. Hey, Sasha, how's it going? It's Brandon calling from the Signals of Intuition. Hey, I'm fine. How are you? Good, good, good. Um, so when I do these, I always like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then kind of work our way through your career and that kind of thing. Because I especially love hearing the earlier stories of how everybody gets started. So starting at the beginning of you as a musician, where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? Oh, wow. Well, interesting. <laughs> I grew up in, uh, in Germany and in Wolfsburg, which is like a the town where the Volkswagen factory is. So it's basically more or less an industrial town in a way. But I was, I was always living on the countryside. So a uh, well-protected little Sasha growing up in the forest, <laughs> more or less, uh, with my parents being music lovers, totally. I would say half hippie uh, music lovers. So I grew up with the Rolling Stones, uh, Bob Dylan, Steve Ray Vaughan, my father is a big blues lover, George Thorogood, stuff like this. And that brought me also into the interest of listening to music. But the first time I was really, uh, I mean, okay, I had a drum set when I was five, but that was more as a, like a toy. And as one day I started to make my own guitar out of a piece of carton, uh, stuff like this. This is what like a lot of kids do, right? Mm -hmm. But when I really got started to get interested in, in music, in a, in a different way was when I was maybe 10 and I asked my mother like because I heard this music and uh, I was fascinated by it and I asked her to buy uh, Mama can you buy me a Bach album Johann Johann Sebastian Bach you know yeah and she was like oh, what what is going on with my son <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, she bought it I remember that it was a Bach for kids actually and I was fascinated by this a little bit later I don't know exactly when it was maybe it was 11 10 or 11, 11 maybe, my uncle bought himself a guitar. And uh, since I spent a lot of time in my grandparents' house when I was a kid, because my parents were working and I was spent a lot of my time there, already in the morning sometimes, and my uncle was living there too, and he was playing this guitar. And I was like, oh, cool, this is so cool. And uh, he was trying to learn the stuff, and, and I thought, like, can I also try? And so, and I tried, and I loved it, and... Uh, he stopped after a while, <laughs> so I could have his guitar. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that was the start of, of it, actually. Uh, so without him, I would never have started. And, and I continued. He stopped. I mean, later on, he picked it up again, but he stopped for the moment. And I was taking over his guitar. And then I got my own first guitar as well and learned like the super basic stuff. I think still think it's the right way to learn guitar. I learned like uh, just acoustic uh, guitar. It was nylon guitar in the beginning. I learned to strum and like finger picking and stuff like this, uh, folk songs, uh, stuff like that. You know, I was totally fascinated by did, by did, making music, of course. Yeah. Did you take lessons? Like, were you trained in some way, or did you just kind of learn everything from hanging out with friends and stuff? Basically, I learned everything by just doing it. But I had a little period where I had lessons. Uh, the first one, uh, first round was totally unpleasing, to be honest. I had this lessons and I could already play a bit 
it was this was basically about like playing from a score and playing melodies but it was like i really didn't like it so you had to play these melodies and nobody was able and it was boring in a way nobody was able to play uh, the, the rhythm guitar or like strumming the, the background so because they learned started to learn like simple melodies reading from a score and so i was always the one that had to play the basic of the song because nobody else was able so i was sitting there basically accompanying the others playing their melodies and that was not so good so i stopped uh, doing this and uh, it was probably smart to stop and then i was just playing by myself just by listening and playing with other people i had my first band with 12 i think the band name was season and we were a rock band Funnily, one of the members of this band is also in uh, Masters of Ceremony. <laughs> who, who is that? <laughs> it's Andre. Oh, okay. So you and him obviously go way back then. I didn't realize that. Way wow. back. Way back. It is so funny. It was my birthday two days ago, and there was another member of this group <laughs> on my birthday. So we're sitting there, the three of us uh, sharing memories from... I mean, you know how I don't even want to even dare to say how how long ago that is. <laughs> you know that is almost forty years ago, right? Thirty-seven years ago or thirty-nine? Fucking hell! <laughs> it's a long time ago. It's a long time ago, and uh, we were sitting there sharing memories, and it's it's really cool in a way. And also with Miro, that is not in uh, this band, but uh, I'm still working with him, and he's also in Avantasia. I know him since uh, we were like in the first grade of school so we always been together and i like this strong bonds you know with people and we never had problems also it's, it's, it's very very cool actually okay so take me from you've got this first band now uh how does that eventually evolve into you uh i guess you joined heaven's gate eh because the band was already established by the time you got in as far as i'm aware it, it was no it wasn't called heaven's gate even. Or, or it's called uh, steel tower right yes but it was different the, the whole we didn't play Steel Tower songs. It was a new band. Uh, we didn't play one Steel Tower song, actually, in our life set. Oh, we, this band developed from this band called Steel Tower, but somehow uh, it was started like a new band, and uh, there was no, basically no, no leftover from Steel Tower, uh, music-wise, in a way, except the influence it had on the people there, of course. Uh, but a lot of stuff was already written for the first album when I joined, actually. I mean, there's a lot of... St- no, we made a big jump now. Uh, until I joined there, I joined them when I was 17, and we already also started to record the album when I was 17. And I joined them because, first of all, uh, Thomas, the singer, knew me and saw me from another band that had a record contract already. When I was 15, I, I joined this band in, in Wolfsburg. So I was always a, a young, <laughs> very young with uh, older musicians. Yeah. Lee. So, but they were always older than me. Also, like, Thomas is 10 years older than me. Uh, yeah, he, they asked me if I could play the solos on, on there because he saw me uh, with this band and they wanted to have somebody that could play, the, uh, like, uh, main solos or, like, a lot of solos on the album and asked me to do this. And uh, for this, I mean, I listened to the tape and I was like, wow, what a singer, really cool. And uh, I went to the rehearsal room with them and then we just found the chemistry was totally there. And so we were like, yeah, found ourselves jamming and having fun and saying like, why shouldn't I join? Um, don't you just want to join the band? I uh, said, yeah, cool, great, I, I do this. And then we were doing the first album in Control, and uh, I could have still a little influence on it, not as much as on, as on the, uh, the next albums, of course. And uh, yeah, that was the start of it. Uh, as a, so to say, professional musician in a way. It was never really professional in a money kind of way. <laughs> Talking about Evans Gate, we never really could live off the music or anything like it. That was basically uh, like a hobby. We always wanted, but it never worked out. <laughs> <laughs> so how was it working alongside Tommy Hansen as a producer who worked on the first album? And uh, also, I understand that Frank Borneman from Eloy was really instrumental in helping the band during this period. Uh, how much of a push did he give the band? Frank was more responsible, of course, putting the band together in a way, you know, like setting everything up. He was coming to the rehearsal room. We were doing, working on some songs. He made some suggestions. Make this faster, make this whatsoever, you know. Uh, maybe it can try another beat. He was to do some, some basic suggestions. But the artistic producer, more or less, in the studio, 
was more, I mean, he came down every once in a while from his office and uh, had his opinions and stuff, you know, but working the general work, as artistic work also, as a producer was done by uh, Tommy Hansen. Uh, so he was there all the time and having a lot of input on, on the outcome that was on tape in a way. And he was a funny guy. I really like him. He's still working. And I, I really like to work with him. It was uh, great. And we have made a bond pretty quick. And I was working for him in the same production at night. We continued with something else. He asked me if I could play guitar for him on another project, you know, like it was a pop album she, he did. Uh, uh, like a couple of hours every night after finishing the production for Heaven's Gate, you know. And I was also then with him, like, uh, uh, working on some other stuff. So I was totally thrilled by this studio work. I loved it. And, uh, yeah, this is how this love for the studio work was basically born. I mean, I was already doing demos and stuff. I was the guy responsible for, usually in the band, for making the demos, uh, taking care of, like, the equipment. There's always one idiot. It has to take care, and I was it, and uh, I could take advantage of this thing in the studio because I knew a little bit, so I could understand how things work slightly. Yeah, so I started to do some tape operation as well. Like I was recording Bonnie, the other guitar player, because he was was a bit shy and he felt better recording with me. And so th this is also how all this developed as a producer and as an engineer. So all of that then, that all started with Tommy then, eh? So he kind of took you under his wing to learn all that stuff? Mm, no, actually not. I played for him. We were more working together in a musical way. And I was just checking out what he was doing, of course. He was showing me his... Uh, he had, like, his first digital like computers, like, first samples that you could hear, like, out of two Atari Falcons, I remember. And I was like, wow, what is what is this, you know, and I was thrilled. But he didn't really show me how a mixing console works or something like it. I was just catching fire on his work for this thing, you know. I was just watching and uh, doing some tape operation. Then he showed me some little things, maybe, how to operate the tape. And because we were already, always recording, back in the day we were recording on analog tape, right? Actually, the one that really put me more into this world and where I learned the most of is Charlie Bauerfeind. Because... The that, that's actually, I was just going to ask you about him. So tell me about um, that next, like, did you meet him for the next record you guys did, or were you already working with him by that point? No, we did one more album, uh, like a, a mini album in between. It was called Open the Gate and Watch. Ah, right, right, okay. And right. then uh, this was done with uh, another producer, uh, but it was, it was just a mini album, but it was very interesting. This uh, production was very different, a super different approach than uh, in Control. Also, with this producer I was walking, started to work besides. <laughs> it was very funny. Uh, his name was Ralf, and uh, yeah, we started to work on... I don't know why, but also there, it was like... I mean, I always had this relation to these people, in a way, you know? And like, and then he said, ah, I'm, I'm working with this guy, like the drummer of Eddie Grant. <laughs> you remember <laughs> Eddie Grant? <laughs> yeah, I know the name, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like a reggae guy, and he was there, and there was this singer, and... I did stuff. I was weird. I was playing bass and guitar, and uh, the thing was with him, yeah. And then uh, the next album we did was Living in Hysteria, and uh, Frank Bonnemann back in the day suggested Charlie that was just finishing. He just did one album in Germany, this first one that was Sieges Even. Oh, yep, yep, yep. And um, we heard this, and we're, oh, wow, we thought it was great, and he just basically finalized his studies in Boston a while ago before. So he was just suggesting Charlie to be the producer, and we, we met him, and then we yeah we decided to work with him, and started to work on Living in Hysteria, and and this totally, I was totally on fire then because I he let me in uh, like doing a little bit more even, I was I mean I was totally interested in it, and he would like I would ask stuff and he would answer, and he is he was also just basically starting to work as a professional engineer. But he had more experience, much more, of course, than me, because he was studying it already. I didn't have a fucking clue. I was just doing self-trained stuff like I did all my life, like the music and like everything else, always basically self-trained. But he was the one that put me into this production thing in a way. Uh, I mean, I was working, I was. I started to be very influential as an artistic producer already on the Open the Gate and Watch mini album. And uh, then... On this album, I was totally into like taking, not taking over, but really having a hand on the artistic touch, 
how it should sound, how it uh, should be put together, how it should be arranged. I was totally infected by the virus. <laughs> Were you working a lot as kind of, you know, like producing and coaching the artists and that kind of thing too in the studio? Later on, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm sure. I'm sure now. Yeah, of course. E even back then, though, were, yeah. were you kind of pushing people? Hey, sing that line again, or try yeah, it this yeah, way, I was or, always yeah, all that. I, I was always around and always. I, like I said, I was, no, no, we have to do like no, no, this the drums and I was actually always there and somehow playing a, a role in this regard as well. And he obviously saw that and saw my interest and um, maybe that I have a talent for it. And so he asked me, actually, uh, and I never did it before. It was a while after, not so much after the production. Uh, he asked me if I could take over a production for him. And uh, that was really, we, we say this in Germany, like a jump into the cold water. Yeah. And I just said, yes, I do it. And I, you have to see, it's, uh, I really didn't, I knew some stuff, but in a very... Uh, not connected, you know, some little things, you know, but I didn't know how a big board like that, that, that they had their works exactly. And I didn't know every relation to everything and how it works. And I don't know what it means to record an analog tape. I mean, it's not just to throw a cassette tape in. It's, it's a big piece of thing, a two inch tape that you have to put in there. You have to know how to cut it. You have to know certain things, how to, uh, the levels and everything. You have to make everything you can do a lot of mistakes much more than you can do now i mean you can still do many mistakes but it was much harder yeah and i just said yeah i'll do it and I, I just had an afternoon that he could supervise me on on the production and then he left to america and i was supposed to finalize the basic recordings in the meantime and there was an american producer sitting behind me in a way and i didn't have a fucking clue what i was doing and he just told me like uh oh, this is the mixing console the the signals is here you go through the wall and then you push this this is an inline console and when you push this then it comes down at the other bottom fader and this is the eq this is this and that and this uh, the whole patch bay everything you know he explained me the everything i needed and also the computer the first time i worked with a macintosh actually he worked with a he had like a small se it's like the predecessor for of the of the classic it's like the small you probably know it, like the included monitor, like a seven, seven inch monitor, black and white. And the program was called Performer. And we were recording MIDI data with a trigger in the same time back in the day already. And I didn't know anything. And I had to basically, he explained me everything in one afternoon. And when he left, I was like, fucking hell, what have I done? What did I actually say I can do? I was really, really pressured in a way. So he left. I was there with this stuff. The hardest thing was this guy in my back, like this producer, <laughs> that was a, uh, was a, uh, like an artistic producer in a way for this band. And so I was. The what, uh, well, what 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 band was this? Uh, so uh, that was a did. German band. It was called TTC. It was a funk, very funky, a little bit of metal influence, but more funky band. And but it was interesting. It was, it was cool guys, and I don't know how, but when he came back, the stuff was recorded. Everybody was happy. I really don't know how. I, I, until, until now, I mean, I have a lot of memories about stuff, but this is like a black hole. I guess I was so stressed that I forgot a lot of things. I just remember, like, I was sitting there. How the fuck do I get this signal in, on there? From this wall, from this microphone <laughs> to this tape machine. And somehow I could figure out how it worked after this, uh, like, one afternoon of explaining. And after this production, Charlie asked me if I would be interested in being his partner in the production. Like, so we would be, like, a producer team, and I was more responsible for uh, taking, I, I mean, also doing recordings and stuff, but also more responsible for the artistic stuff, and also because I was, he could tell that I was playing a guitar and bass, and also keyboards, a little bit of drums, so I was uh, able to step in also, as a musician, when, when we had problems. So uh, together we were like a really a cool team. And this is what I did in the beginning. The next production was already Angel's Cry from Angra. Ah. And there, there I did like f a lot of keyboards, for example. And I started to do this all this orchestral stuff back in the day. You know, I bought samplers and I won one in the competition. I won this sampler and then I had suddenly this cool stuff. Cool for back in the day. Now everybody would laugh about it, of course. But back in the day it was really cool. 
And yeah, and suddenly my interest was very high on doing like this orchestral stuff and stuff like this. And, but I also did recordings, and, uh, vocal recordings, guitar recordings, bass recordings, drums. I did all of this. But he was more on the engineering side and I was more on the musician side still. He was also a musician, but uh, so we uh, were always crossing ways, you know. But we were both having an impact on uh, on the artistic side with like doing our recordings. Sometimes we also worked in shifts, right? So he would record drums in the day, I would record guitar and vocals in the night or whatsoever. Now, stuff like this happened all the time. This is yeah how everything started. And what well, was very successful was gold right away in Japan and then everything was set. So we were producing a producer team for a couple of years and we did many, many albums together, kind of successful. And until yeah, our ways got separated, not because of a problem, just because I decided or we decided with Heaven's Gate to buy our own studio, to invest our uh, money from uh, from the record company into buying our own stuff because I was able to work it. And there was Miro uh, coming in the game. He was uh, he was studying this engineering stuff in the meantime and uh, was always a friend of mine, of course, through all the years. And then he could also help in the productions, we thought, and that's what we did. So we did the first Heaven's Gate that we did in our own studio. Then it was self-produced so by Miro and me. So that's what we wanted to do. Then our ways got separated because he took over another production in the meantime, and then it was overlapping and we never came together again. And well, that just simply faded out. And actually, I haven't seen him for a long time. I would really love to see him and see how he's doing. But he, uh, he, he was always good to me and a big help in, in, in my career. And uh, yeah, it, it was good. And then, but then a new whole era started. We, we did the stuff in Gate Studio. It's just and, uh, just uh, jumping yeah. back for a second, um, on Planet E, you guys covered Animal from the Canadian singer Lisa Dalbello. Yes. How did this cover come up? As a, as a Canadian, yes. I'm really, you know, I love this cover and I've played it many, many times because it actually counts as Canadian content. Yeah. So I get to play this German metal, power metal cover of a Canadian tune. D- did you guys learn about her <laughs> from the Queensryche cover? How, how did you get to know about Lisa Dalbello and how did that cover come about? It's funny. It's funny. It's, a, you know... I would say the guys knew her because of the Queensryche cover, the guys from the band. But I knew her be- way before. I knew her like from the Woman Forces album, mm-hmm. which uh, contains this song. Uh, when I was, I think it came out when I was maybe fifteen. Do you know? The, the remember when it came out? Or sixteen? It, it was. It would have been about that time. Yeah, yeah it was the mid eighties. Yeah, mid eighties. And I had this album as a vinyl way before we did this cover, and I loved this. Album. I, I was working in a record store. This is how I found this album. And uh, I loved it. And I also had the next one. Uh, well, what's the name? Uh, when Let's Tango is on. Uh, we, we did this cover of Animal. Uh, we wanted to do a Del Bello song. We loved this stuff, you know? Uh, it was we, She. Uh, the, the album was She, she by she, the way. She, yes. She. <laughs> oh, of course, She. Oh, I hate when I. The stuff that I always knew suddenly is gone. I, I totally loved her as a singer, and she was always with me basically in the in the 80s that that was one of my favorites and uh, she was even running in like this let's tango for example was even running in the discotheques here so it, it was pretty big not i mean uh, in a more or less maybe a little bit of underground scene but it was known right and i totally loved it i also uh, also loved the horror album really 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 cool great album and you know how I got this this I have to tell you because <laughs> <laughs> this was so cool we made this cover version Animal and suddenly I got I got a mail from the brother of the Lisa Del Bello and uh, kindly asking if we have the permission to, to cover this song and I and I was like oh I'm uh, apologize apologies I never really asked thought about asking for permission to cover it because in Europe it's totally legal we you don't have to ask for permission as long as you don't change the song. You don't. You should not. Shouldn't change the melody and shouldn't change the chords. And uh, if you don't do this, you don't have to ask for permission. Of course, you have to uh, credit the the artist, and they get the money for it. You don't get the copyright, of course. So you just have to 
do this copyright thing right and then everything is good which we did and i explained him and he was like oh that's i just wanted to ask sorry for asking by the way i love the ver version or uh, at least i love the version too and he sent me the poor album and she said like just give me your address uh, i will send you the new album and i appreciate that you like uh, our stuff and that was so cool so he sent me the whole album like from canada that was a cool thing back in the day oh that's <laughs> awesome that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah huge, huge fan of hers as well. Just one of those unknown yeah. people who she's worked with everybody and like, you know, it's she's known but known to musicians and, you know, but she, she's just awesome. Yeah, because she's a true artist. She's not, uh, she made very few albums and uh, I think she's, and it doesn't matter, you know, I love the stuff that, that she made and it's enough, it's enough for me. <laughs> it's just a, it would be cool if if she would do one more. Maybe now. <laughs> Actually, did did you like the core album as well? Yeah, I've heard a few songs. I honestly, it's been so long since I've heard it. I can't remember. If it's, this song eleven, for example, is like, I really think it's cool. Also, I mean, just the cover artwork to be there on this album, call, be be yourself, a photo of yourself, a cool photo actually. And call this album whore. <laughs> <That> was so <laughs> fucking cool. Wow. I loved it. Yeah, very, yeah, very, very, very artistic but for sure. Generally, I I like Canadian artists. I mean, there was always something about Canadian artists, in a way. I mean, there's a lot of Canadian artists that made it, right? <laughs> oh, of course, Rush, and you know, there's yeah. some we try not to talk about, like Nickelback, but uh, no, great, no. great musicians, you know. No, of course, yeah. I know. Great. I do know that. Um, it's I, I was in Frankfurt last year. And uh, as soon as I said Canadian, everybody said to me, oh, Brian Adams. Because I, I, I guess you guys love him over there, right? Eh? Ah, he was big here, of course, yeah. He was very big. Uh, and, and, I mean, that was probably, if you would tell me, okay, if I would not know Lisa Del Bello, I would have, uh, Canadian prison musician, I would say Brian Adams. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, all right, so jumping ahead a little bit, a musician that you've you know had a long-standing relationship with now is uh, Tobias Samet. I know you guys started working yes. together. I think it was the Hellfire album, right? When you guys got together. Yes. T tell me how you met him and how you guys started to work together and how that you know has grown into what it has with Avantasia. First, we met actually um, <laughs> on a flight to Brazil. We were both invited to do a guest appearance on the DVD of Shaman. Ah. Shaman, the band of Andre Matos. The that sadly passed away this year, which was a super big shock. I was just having an interview before with Rock Brigade, and I still had tears in my eyes when I called you, actually. Oh, I, I was going to ask, because I know you guys have such a history together, but I also kind of, I know it's fresh, right? So Totally, totally. Yeah, it's, uh, oh, it's bad, really. It's, uh, wow. It's, I really get emotional when, when I talk about it, still. But anyway, uh, so, Andre... Uh, Talked to Andre, I think, uh, like, and he said, like, oh, also Toby is invited to the DVD to come over to. It was the DVD live in São Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, actually. Uh, in the end, we ended up with only the São Paulo show uh, on DVD, and we but we played both shows, and uh, so we both were invited to play these two shows, and uh, two or three people of Halloween was there, uh, and who else was there? Uh, I don't remember now, but anyway, so we were both invited there. We catched up before because we knew we would have the same flight to go there. So so we exchanged the phone numbers via Andre. Uh, I mean, I had the contact already because I just did a little job for, for Toby before, but we just had a slight conversation on the phone because I recorded some stuff, Andre's vocals actually, for the first Avantasia albums. And so that was the first contact with Toby, but very, very uh, slight contact only, just the one or two phone calls and... Yeah, thanks a lot. Cool, cool job. This and that, and uh, yeah, and that is the, that is the first time we met actually on the plane. So we had a little phone call, we phone a talk on the phone before, and then we met there in Frankfurt at the airport, and yeah, sat together and talked and talked and yeah, and we had this great time in Brazil. Uh, it was real fun and uh, cool shows, and, uh, and we flew back, and then he was just. One day he was just, I don't know if we talked about it there already, maybe, but he said, like, I really would like to work with you and uh, maybe let's try that out. Maybe just you can help out on the Hellfire Club or maybe on the, maybe you can do, do the drum recording and help on the guitar sound and do some recordings, maybe some vocals. And, yeah, that's what we did then. And uh, they liked the work and I really like enjoyed the work also with, uh, especially with Toby, because, I mean, 
with everybody, but Toby was my, uh, I worked the most with Toby actually. And uh, yeah, he was the driving force also having me as a producer for Edgar and then all started. And yeah, one day we talked about Avantasia again and he thought he will never do this again. And I said, why not? He said, ah, oh, it's complicated, this and that. Uh, get the, I said, no, nah, just send me an idea and I arrange you something and we see. And if you like it, we can think about doing it. And if not, we forget about it. And that, that song was the Scarecrow. Uh, so he sent me this rough idea of, of a song. It wasn't called Scarecrow yet. And so I put my stuff in and arranged it in a certain way, added stuff and sent it back. And he was totally thrilled and loved it. And he said, like, we got to do it. We got to do it. And that's what we did then. We did the album and the same happened to the live stuff, you know. And then we just said, I've got to do it live. He said, that's never going to work. He said, why? Just try it. I mean, get somebody asking the people, get it to it together, see a promoter, see the promoters and see what happens. And we did. And I mean, we are happy that we did because now it's really working out, right? Oh, it's great. I mean, we, yeah. I, well, I saw you guys uh, in Chicago a few months ago. Ah, okay. Okay, these shows are a little bit uh, smaller. Then uh, uh, reception was usually very cool. But America and Canada is a little bit smaller, actually, than, uh, for example, South America or Europe. I super enjoy to play <laughs> Canada and also uh, uh, America because I expected, especially in America, I, I didn't expect the people being so cool. The, like, uh, the reception was very good. I remember playing the first time in New York. It was, it was the tour before. I was, like, thrilled. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? I didn't really expect this. And... Uh, it was really grown over the years, and now it's really a, well, a big thing for us. I mean, we do uh, we did kind of 40 to 50 shows this year in, I don't know, over 20 countries, and even Australia, first time this year, and it's really, really cool. I mean, we have a long history now together, Toby and I also. I mean, I have a long history with a lot of people now, because I'm a, I'm a very old guy <laughs> now. I mean, actually, I started very early. But I have a long career already, and I'm not planning to stop it soon. But uh, and I hope I have some good years <laughs> yeah. to continue. And uh, I guess I have. That's also the reason I started something fresh now because I really think I want to get into new, we say new waters, explore new waters, and see what what I can do with my own metal band also touring and stuff. You know. Yeah. Well, I know just to kind of bridge that gap. Because I know you've done, you know, you did the album, the Paith Matos album uh, in the past. And you, you've done, yes. obviously, Avantasia and some other stuff in between. Have you kind of had, like, you know, a band of your own in that time in between? Yes, I had a band called The Wire Pushers. Ah, okay, right, right, right. Okay. But that was not metal. It was uh, rock, a little bluesy influences. Well, uh Different. Yeah, so that, that probably kind of draws back to you know your dad's influence and that kind of thing. No, also, also, but also it has a it had a punky influence a little bit, and uh, yeah, you gotta check it out. It's just different. It was also uh, like an album, uh, like uh, with a lot of driven by musicianship in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like uh, I had to do this. I just by coincidence, I started to write these songs because I was. Originally, it was supposed to write songs for somebody else in, in that direction, and I liked it so much uh, that I thought, like, no, I do this, I do this for myself. We gotta, gotta put this together, make a band out of it, and uh, yeah, that was the, followed by this tragedy with like the bass player who was passing away, at, like very young age, 27. That was already building. He, he was building the whole thing with me. Actually, he was working here in my studio. He was like a son, brother type of thing moving here into even the same village and that was a super tragic bad story actually and uh so this was just a, a dark shadow over the whole thing in a way and it kind of never recovered plus uh, the reception of it wasn't really great from the metal community because it wasn't simply metal right and it's very hard for me to it was very hard for me to gain ground in with music that has basically nothing to do with what the people knew me for. Yeah, it's so true, though. You know, it's I've talked to metal musicians all the time, and it's the same thing. It's like when they go to branch out, I was talking to Jeff Tate about his solo album that sounds nothing like Queensryche whatsoever. 
And it's the same thing. It's like you had the few people who yeah. listen to other stuff and they got it. But it's like, you know, and it's the same with that album, I'm sure, for you. It's, you know, the people who, who are into other stuff love it, but the core metal fans are like, what, what is this? That's not what Sasha Paith is that we know him for, yeah. you know, so. Of course, because it's a big, it was a big part of me, right? It's just not uh, the part that they knew. But it, it is a part that they knew the influences of. So I think it's interesting to, to know this as well. And uh, now I tried it different. I mean, now I'm... I just really decided, in a way, I, I make my first metal album now under my uh, control, in a way, right? Because it's time for it, and I always let influences in. Also, there you can you can tell influences in, in that album too. It's that that are not coming exclusively from metal, right? But uh, with having in mind, I will do a metal album now. I produce it in the way I used to produce the metal stuff, also, but just rougher in a way but now now i have the right reception <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean I, i've you know i've been listening to it the last couple of days it's great i'm really really enjoying the new much. album um i can't i i don't know any of the song names i'm so sorry it just kind of plays in the background and no, no, you know because no, no. i don't have like a, a cd of it where i can kind of gauge oh that's number one you know but um the third song from the end i i'm in love with i've listened to like 20 times and i'm completely blanking on the name i'm so sorry <laughs> The third song is called Radar. The, the, I, it's, it's like number eight, I think. The eight or I forgot. There's... A, tra- a track number eight. Okay, it's called Sick. Yeah, it's a uh, Sick is the one where she screams a lot. Yeah, yeah, that that one. Uh, the, the whole album, I love that. That one kind of you know you kind of pick an early favorite on the album, and so far I really really like that one. Oh, cool. Thank you. But uh, okay, so tell me, did uh, Sergio did uh, Sergio Sergio? I... Serafino. Serafino, thank you. Sorry, not Serafino. Yeah. <laughs> Too many names we've talked about today. <laughs> yeah. Did he approach you, or were you already kind of building yes. this? Oh, okay, so he came to you and said he, he was, wants oh, to no, do an album. No, no, not at all. He was, he was calling me for five years or something. Ah, okay. Every month, a couple of months. Hey, Serafino here. <laughs> right? I said, oh, Serafino, I want to do an album with you. <laughs> you know. And he was always asking. He wanted to do an album under my name. He, you know, he was a fan of my work. He, he said, at least, and said like he did so many things, so many albums. Uh, I mean, a big influence in, in Italy, of course, was Rhapsody. Oh, of so course. Was, so I'm known there because of Rhapsody. He said you did so many things and have so much influence on the scene. When are you doing something for you and under your name? It's really time to put your name in the front. You have to do it. And I thought, like, I'm not so sure. I want to do this. And then, and also, he, he was talking more about, like, a project like uh, like Avantasia. You know, so get some people, get some singers, get, you know. And I didn't really want to do this because, I mean, we have Avantasia already. And it doesn't really make any sense. Sure. Uh, to me, at least. And uh, I didn't want to do this. And uh, I also did not want to, not at the moment, at least, to uh, come back with a Heaven's Gate reunion. It was just not simply there was nothing like this in the making you know and uh, also not what i want at the moment maybe one day who knows right uh, but not what i wanted to do so um so i said no <laughs> for five years and but last year i was just i don't know how it come it came but uh, he didn't call me actually i was he, he called me maybe three months before or four months before and then i was sitting here and i was thinking oh i think the time is right <laughs> But I do it. Dif- I have to do it different. I have to do it. I have to do a band. It's like the Blues Bros. We got to get the band together. No, it's like I have to do a band and uh, and have to tour. And it should not be this project. And I have to do like something real, something cool. And I have to do a metal album. And I'm, I was really ready for doing it. A metal album in the way I think how I would approach metal nowadays, and which is a little bit different than. Nowadays, metal is approached many times. Uh, I wanted to do it in a more raw way, not so thought out. I mean, of course, it's thought out in a way, but not not so... Uh, I mean, basically, I'm working a lot out of my guts in a way, right? Uh, this is like my personality in e- everything I'm doing. So I just wanted to do something that screams at you, that is raw and true and uh, not so polished and embellished. I wanted to do something like a real, what is actually metal for me in a way, something that shows its aggression as well in a raw format. 
and uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So for, and, for uh, this, did you write everything in advance, or did you get the band together no. in a room and you guys work it out and all of that? Well, no, no, uh, none of this. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, uh, this is what I want to do now. But on this album, first I got the band together, and then I got the record deal straight. <laughs> <laughs> Because I knew I don't need songs. I mean, I, I got the record deal without one song demo, right? And when I chose Adrian as a singer, I chose her and we made a demo with an old Heaven's Gate song, actually, that I just re-recorded real quick in a different key for like to fit her range better. And uh, so I didn't have one song back then. The thing is, I decided to, to write most of the stuff for the first album on my own because I wanted to set a direction. I made many things in, in, the, in the past, right? I started many bands that nobody knows of and did many things when I was younger. And putting many characters together, developing something new can take ages. And simply, I don't want to do this now. I don't have ages. You know, I want to do something that is to the point what I want, exactly what I want. And uh, But I want to have still people that influence me. But I want to set a direction first. I basically started writing the songs very, very, very late. Uh, just actually, I started writing the songs two weeks before Adrian came here to record. So I had her booked here for four weeks for for the recording session, and I was planning to start in June with my with the songs. And uh, everything took so long with Avantasia that I was just starting in the middle of October, and Adrian was booked here to come on the beginning of November, which was, I was like two weeks before she came, I, was, I didn't have one song. I was fucking hell. And no lyrics, nothing. You know, I had some I, little ideas on my phone. I mean, just little things. And so I was starting to sit down. I thought like, okay, she comes in two weeks or two and a half. And when she comes, she has to be, I have to have something, you know, to like at least four songs or something. And that's what I did. So I started writing, demoing the, the stuff for me, basically, I don't really do demos, so I basically keep everything that I do on a demo. So this is the production at the same time. I do the same with Avantasia usually also, and other things. So I re started recording, writing songs. The first song I made was actually Time Has Come, The Time Has Come. It was a riff I just had on my phone, and then I thought like, wow, very hectic. <laughs> I have to do something out of this. And this, I think it's this turned out really cool. I just started to play uh, because of the, our first live show I started to play the stuff today relearn the stuff you know from the production and it's like wow fucking hell this is gonna kill me life and this was the first song I had and then I had uh, uh, two or three more and when she came I continued writing when she was resting because she was really smashed when she came here and uh, so I told her just take your time you can come down in the afternoon no, no worries and so I was writing and writing lyrics and stuff but I really wanted to have her co-writing stuff as well. But I, I, I knew that I need to write a certain portion of the songs uh, myself, and I wanted to do this. And then there's already a direction. She knows where I'm coming from. When we found also a way of how she approaches the singing, because she sings different than she sings in her own band, in, in Seven Spires. So we developed this way of working, and when this was already, maybe after one and a half or two weeks, we started to write together also. So on four songs, she was co-writing. One of it is actually sick, the one that you like so much. And uh, yeah, and this was really good because, I mean, I can tell you the songs, that another one is Wide Awake and another one is um, The Path. The Path was very interesting, the way we worked out this one. And another one is... Where would it be? Where would it be? She just did a little bit on the mid part, actually. So I just I didn't have a bridge, a vocal line, and a lyric to the just to the mid part, and I just asked her just because uh, it was so cool what she did on the other songs. Can you just? I'm missing this. Can you just write this? <laughs> and uh, so that was cool. So I found out we can really work on lyrics together and and music and share the work, like I did also with Tommy a lot of times. I did Tommy from uh, Camelot. We really could write together on lyrics pretty well and throw ideas and uh, on music as well. And I can do the same with her. And it worked out so fine. And uh, I'm very happy that we tried it. And I'm very happy with the result and what she brought into the music. 
that I want to have more now, of course. But I also want to have in input from the other uh, guys in a certain way, like uh, especially Corvin, because he, he writes songs. Uh, Andre is usually not a songwriter, but I think I can have input from him. I mean, he had also some input on uh, on the path, for example. Uh, he, you know, came up with that melody on the uh, parts of it, at least uh, of the D bass. We have a boat D bass there that's playing melody. And uh, Felix, I want to have I want to have the influences of everybody. Uh, so the next album we're gonna approach in a different way, like all in one room, pre-write some stuff, leave stuff open, uh, and I want to see what happens because I did this a couple of times already usually was super happy with the result and I want to do this with these guys and do the next one even more band style maybe the documentary about it so really like uh, being in the studio working out the stuff like like you should <laughs> but like I said it was important for me to set a direction to know where we are heading this is this this is what we have now and this is from where we go and it is a style I wanted to set. Now I'm open. I'm open to, for input. I, I love, I love input, and I'm in the last. That I don't really have a. I mean, everybody has an ego, but uh, if somebody if somebody has a better idea, I'm totally fine and totally open, right? And uh, you have to let this happen, and then you can get make good, good music. And I really hope we can work like this in the, on the next album more. Oh, that's great. Tell me really quick. You mentioned Corvin. Uh, how did you come to meet him? From Uli's band? Uh, I met him, I think the first time I met him, I don't even know it was the first time, but the first thing that we really worked on together was uh, uh, the Uli John Roth uh, album, uh, The Scorpions Revisited. Oh, did you work on that? Yeah, I recorded it. Oh, you're kidding me. Because I, I know Helge yes. from Fair Warning, I know he mixed it. He mixed, he mixed yeah, it, Yeah, okay. I, I didn't even realize that you worked on that. That's unbelievable. No, no, I recorded it uh, together with Arne Pigant, a friend of mine. We did it uh, actually uh, like in a little theater in Hanover, where the Scorp where the Scorpions used to yeah they where they rehearse. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, was was kind of a cool thing, and that that is the first time I worked with Corvin a little bit more close. I think actually I, I met him before. I think on a Full Metal Cruise, I met him before, but this is the first time we worked together. And then we worked together on the Full Metal Cruises. We played together. We we started to make this uh, acoustic shows and stuff like that, and then I invited him to play keyboards in some of the albums I produced, for example, Old Beyond the Black stuff. He did uh, uh, quite some stuff for me. We did an album together last year with a guy from London. Uh, his name is Joe Colliver, very cool artist. Like a like he's a singer, and this this is not metal. Uh, it's between from Nick Cave to Tom Waits over. Uh, whatsoever uh, acoustic and a little bit of blues uh, Corvin is a wonderful piano player too and uh, Andre is also there in the same band we made like a, a kind of a um, live band that, that really was in the studio and he played a lot of D-bass there that's also why I'm having D-bass now in, in this band because I just loved it so much that's, that was it was just so cool it's a really unique sound too for sure to be it, able to work it is a that. really unique sound and uh, also Jamie Little was in this band. Jamie Little is the uh, the drummer of Uli John Roth, that I also met with that in that session. He's a great drummer, and uh, so there I could also figure out the input Andre can make because we uh, we all sat in a room. We just wrote the songs before uh, Joe and I wrote the songs on acoustic guitar, and I didn't make a demo on purpose except the one or two songs that we did before when we met. I had this. Uh, it stayed like it in the in the end. We just added some stuff, but uh, most of the material uh, was just done on acoustic guitar, and I just made the demo on my iPhone. That was my intention. See what happens if we bring good musicians together that I think that are creative, that are nice. Get them together in the studio, and we didn't have a lot of time even. I would sit together, listen to my fucking iPhone demo, where I just strum the guitar and he sings or like pick the guitar whatsoever. And I had some ideas in what direction could stuff could go, but I said, like, what is your idea about this? What would you suggest? And usually there was always something coming from somebody, also from me, this and that going back and forth. And somehow we had something super different than I would, something like I would never have come up, or nobody individual of us would kind of come up on his own. And uh, that was an experience last year. It was so cool. Uh, and Corvin especially is also somebody you can really work like this. 
with uh, in a very good way that I decided to have I need Corvin in my band and this experience was great and I hope you will I don't know you also listen to other stuff I, I assume than uh, metal right no of course yes so, uh, of course maybe you come across this album later on his name is Joe Collar it's really really cool it's not out yet but we, we try to find a way to bring it out it's not so easy nowadays actually it's, if no, it's, not, I it's, it's funny it couldn't be any easier and yet it's so much harder at the same time it is harder we probably do it ourselves like the modern way right but we see anyway uh, this experience also this recording like manifested a little bit the uh, wish to work more like this and uh, to bring people together and have I mean I did so many things on my own the last 30 years I was sitting so much in my room, alone, arranging, recording, doing this and that. It can be good, you know, but it's also so great if you have get people together and something is happening that just happens with that combination on that certain day, in that certain mood, because we drank a bottle of wine or because we ate this and that. It's a moment that you capture and you will never be able to recreate. And this is so great about stuff like this. And this is what music is about. This is what art is about as well. Of course, you can also do stuff on your own. And it's, I, I did some stuff that I'm really happy with and I'm proud of. But now the time is for me to bring people together and get the best out of it. I did enough alone in my life. And now I want to get more other people together. And Masters of Ceremony should be more to this direction in the future. Right. Um so you've mentioned it, you know, being a band, you guys are going to do another record. I take it there's plans to tour on this then, eh? On this album. Yes, like I said, we have the first show uh, in uh, on on Mallorca, uh, uh, Spanish island, on uh, in October. It's just the, the initial show, and there's no tour this year. But we're talking about touring in, in the beginning of next year. But it's not set yet. Uh, it's not so easy for us to get a tour actually going. I have two options maybe now. But we have to see if this is going to work out. I would love to. You know, it's funny. Um, I was just at Prague Power USA, and they always do the yeah. big announcement video. The whole week, everyone's making predictions. Who's going to be in next year's festival, right? Because they keep it really tightly locked down as far as announcements. Yeah. Your name came up so much when I was talking to people. Everyone said, I'll bet you we're going to get Sasha Pace's oh, Masters well. of Ceremony. Yeah, I, I, I must have heard that from uh -huh. 20 people. So again, it's everyone guessing, but I, I thought that was really cool. You know what? We already talked about it this year, actually, and <laughs> that this being our, our initial show, but it didn't work out in, in this short period of time. So I'm happy if he invites me. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, it would be great. Uh, and I'm looking to get festivals next year as well, and I would love to play there. What? Uh, not to overly spoil anything, but as far as set list. Because you guys have done so much stuff between everybody and the band. Are you guys just sticking to Masters of Ceremony? Do you think you'll maybe throw a couple different covers in? Or like, do you guys plan on maybe doing like a Heaven's Gate song, a Seven Spire song, that kind of thing? You, <laughs> you actually absolutely got my concept. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, we just have one album, so we couldn't do a full show anyways. I mean, uh, already the show in, uh, on Mallorca, is, uh, the album would be too short to fill the show. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we have to play the full album and that's it, you know. Uh, we almost play the full album on this show, except one song maybe. But maybe also the full album, I'm not sure yet. And uh, we're going to play two or three covers. But uh, uh, the plan was, original plan was to play songs that I also wrote with other people for other bands in the past. So maybe... Uh, a Heaven's Gate song, a Camelot song, a Beyond the Black song, or may it be uh, an Avantasia song. What? Who knows? I will play some stuff from my career. I'm not sure uh, Seven Spires fits our style, to be honest. So, I mean, I also made stuff, for example, I listened already to some Epica stuff, and I'm really happy with some the, the way some stuff turned out. But it's maybe not the right stuff for us to cover because we just uh, play a different sound. I want to do stuff that naturally sounds right when we play it in this combination, because as, like I told you, I don't want to put sequencer keyboards or whatsoever on stage. I want to play live. And maybe there's even an Epica song that makes sense when we play it, but we, I want to do stuff that makes sense. But I want to hear my dog in the background. <laughs> he needs <Yeah>. attention. <laughs> oh. 
I, I want to do some of the stuff, maybe also Virgo song, you know, stuff like this. Maybe even an Angra song, you know, uh, I don't know. But I really would like to do this, and I think it could be interesting for the people also. That's, that's a part of it, so you totally uh, found out my secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds great. Um, so I know we're, we're running super long, and Sasha, thank you so much for taking out this extra time to do it. I really appreciate oh, it. Happy that you had so many interesting <laughs> oh, questions. <laughs> I was a little bit surprised you asked like all these like go back so far <laughs> well i mean the thing is too i mean as as you can guess like i've been listening to your stuff a long time both from production i mean i can't tell you how many of the you know cds you've done over the years that i own not even the stuff you've played on but just production stuff so yeah i mean you know i've been listening to heaven's mm -hmm. gate for years and years and then when they announced you in avantage it's like oh this is cool okay you know and it's just kind of grown from there but um <laughs> seriously you know i, I want to say thanks for you know the influence of great music over the years and i'm really liking masters of ceremony no. but yeah so thanks again for taking the time out and i'm um, looking forward to what you have coming up next yeah thank you very much for taking so much time as well <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks. all right i'll okay. let you get to it <laughs> thank thanks, you man. goodbye Bye. Bye. Peace.